Hello friends. Today we are going to discuss about disaster management from mental health perspective. In this video, I am going to discuss about the definition of disaster, various phases of disaster, mental health morbidity during disaster, high risk category and disaster management from mental health perspective. I am Dr. Suresh Padmat, Professor of Psychiatry working at Nimans, Bangalore. Before I start my presentation, I would like to have a disclaimer. This presentation is for academic purpose only. This is not an alternative for any kind of guideline or professional opinion from respective disaster. So please do contact the specialist from the respective disaster. This presentation is based purely on my personal experience of working in various disaster and published articles which I have done in various reviewed journals, basically scientific journals. For legal opinion, please do contact an advocate. With this disclaimer, I will start. This whole presentation is based upon disaster management from mental health perspective, which I had published a review article in Indian Journal of Psychological Medicine in 2015. What is disaster? Can be a car accident can be considered as a disaster or else there should be a public motor vehicle accident can it be called as a disaster or else railway accident or a plane crash should be considered as a disaster. What is the definition of disaster? Is it the number of deaths? It should be one death, hundred or thousand deaths to be called as a disaster. At the same time, can it be a pandemic like COVID can be considered as a disaster? A earthquake without any death, can it be considered as a disaster? Financial stock market crash, can it be considered as a disaster? Or else, flash floods, can it be a disaster? So, there is no any single definition of disaster. But however, it is very important to know the definition of disaster so that we can communicate, yes, there is a disaster. Under what circumstances we call it as a disaster? Because during the disaster, we need to move the resources from the area of unaffected to the area of the disaster so that we can rescue the life and also do rehabilitation. Now let's move into the definition of disaster. There are various definitions of disaster, but in India, the accepted definition is as per the Disaster Management Act of 2005. As per this legislation, disaster means a catastrophe, mishap, calamity, or a grave occurrence in any area arising from natural or man-made causes or any accident or negligence which results in substantial loss of life or human suffering or damage to and destruction of property or damage to or degradation of environment and is of such a nature or magnitude as to beyond the coping capacity of the community affected. So, this is a very complex definition which is very broader and very difficult to specify. I had looked into the various definitions of disaster. There are some commonalities or characteristics. The characteristics of these definitions are that the disaster is of sudden onset, it is unpredictable, uncontrollable, huge magnitude of destruction both in terms of human loss physical structure, financial loss and suffering and it should exceed the coping capacity of the affected community. So then only it will be considered as disaster. These are the characteristics which has been found across all definition of disaster. And this disaster is defined and also implemented by the federal governments especially in India. Once the disaster is declared, then that area requires support either the central government or the state government, NGOs start moving into the disaster zone to provide relief and also rehabilitation. So what is the principle of disaster mental health? That's basically how the disasters are managed. What principle we have kept in it? Earlier, the disaster was based upon only on relief, but now it is based on preventive medicine. That means prevention is better than cure. So instead of focusing on post-disaster relief, now the whole disaster is looked from the preventive measure or readiness. 
So we can understand from six R's. They are readiness, that is preparedness, response, immediate action, so that they mitigate the suffering, relief, sustained rescue work, that is relief, rehabilitation, so that the person gets back into his life, recovery and resilience. Resilience, we will discuss this shortly. So these six R's are the very important principal component of disaster management or also disaster mental health management. Basically, it is a preventive medicine aspects. Prevention is better than cure. So, readiness, response, relief, rehabilitation, recovery and resilience. Now, moving on to the, what are the different phases of disaster, especially in mental health perspective? If you look at the various phases of disaster, there are four important phases. Heroic phase, honeymoon phase, disillusionment phase, and restoration phase. Let's look into the each phases. The phases of disaster, if you look at this, there is a disaster as it strikes. If you look into the y-axis, that is emotion, on the x-axis, it is the duration. As soon as the disaster strikes, there is a emotions will be very high. That means during that phase, it is called as heroic phase. Heroic phase lasts from one day to one week. During this period, it is called as heroic phase because the survivor of the disaster will, will help each other, will do all best possible to rescue his fellow human beings. And that is the reason it is called as heroic phase. During that period, the emotions are very high. Within the end of one to two weeks, during that period, the neighboring states, neighboring districts will provide support in the form of relief. That is the time we call it as honeymoon phase. That is from 2 to 8 weeks. Invariably, we can call it as from 15 days to 60 days. That is the honeymoon phase. This is called as honeymoon phase because during this period, the survivors of the disasters are kept in a relief camp. This is the place where the food, shelter are given free of cost. At the same time, the various media people, VIPs, bureaucrats, politicians do visit this relief camp and they start making various kinds of promises that they will do this, that they will give you the relief, they will give you a package and various kinds of promises will be done. During this period, the whole survivors will be in a very honeymoon phase. First and the foremost, they survive the disaster. Second one, the media attention and the bureaucratic and politician, political attention gives them the honeymoon phase, the well-recognized phase. Once this honeymoon phase starts declining, that is after two to three weeks, the disillusionment phase starts in. Because at the end of two to three months, the media attention starts declining the memory of the disaster comes down. The VIP politicians forgets about the survivors. At the same time, survivors who require the relief material will be caught or entangled in the bureaucratic red tapism. They have to provide various documents and they may be caught in the various, what we call it as bribe. The people who are in the government, NGOs may ask money and this is the time the disillusionment phase starts, kicks in. During this very period, the mental health conditions increases. That is the reason we call it as disillusionment phase. This phase lasts somewhere from two months to two years. This time is a huge time and requires mental health support. And since it is more than two years, there will be anniversary reaction exactly one year from the date of occurrence of the disaster. That is the time you can see some of them committing suicide or else grief reaction can be seen. Hence, we have marked as anniversary reaction. After two to three years, the restoration phase starts in. So please remember, there are four phases, heroic phase, honeymoon phase, disillusionment phase and restoration phase. Restoration phase is nothing but rehabilitation, and they bounce back to their original emotional state. 
So what are the normal human response to any disaster? So how do people respond? Please do remember, the survivor of any disaster, it will be considered as normal people in an abnormal situation. For example, in tsunami, imagine if they are normal people, but in abnormal huge waves. So hence, we call it as normal people in an abnormal situation or abnormal environment. Similarly, COVID infection, normal people in a situation where the infection is everywhere. The third, I can give you about Uttarakhand flash floods. Again here, survivors are in a norm, these are all normal people, but in an abnormal situation called as flash floods. Hence, please do remember, these are all normal people, and normal survivors in an abnormal situation. At the same time, you should know what is normal reaction and abnormal reaction to disaster. Let's first take about the normal reaction. Any normal reaction to any disaster, anxiety, irritability, overwhelmed, fatigue, anger, feeling of lonely, scared, frustration, sadness and so forth. These are the normal reactions. For example, you can see in COVID, anxiety, irritability, these were there and everyone has different types of emotional reaction. So please do remember, these are all normal people in an abnormal situation. Similarly, there may be abnormal reaction, that is abnormal grief reaction in the form of absent any kind of emotions, delayed emotion, exploding and various different kinds of sudden like suicidal attempt, suicide, increased drug or increased alcohol intake, they are all abnormal reaction. Survivor's guilt, for example, I had seen many patient, people, survivors during tsunami, they used to say that I should have been dead instead of my father. So this kind of survivor guilt, I, I should have been dead but I am alive. So that, that survivor guilt is one which is very, very essential to be dealt with. If we don't deal with survivor's guilt, it may have a mental health consequences in the long run. Losing control, losing control of emotion. This is again a normal reaction. And a normal grief reaction, that is basically we talk about Kubler-Ross normal grief reaction. Shock, denial, bargain, acceptance, depression and acceptance. So these symptoms of what we call it as normal grief reaction can also be seen. But however, sometimes there will be abnormal reactions in the form of depression, anxiety disorder, panic disorder, somatization disorder, alcohol, drug intake, post-traumatic stress disorder and so forth you can see in abnormal human reaction. So now the question is, what is the prevalence of mental health morbidity in disaster affected population? That's basically, if you compare between normal population and disaster affected population, how much is the difference in presence of psychiatric illness between the normal population and the disaster affected population? If you look at that, the mental health morbidity is very high in disaster affected population. It may be two to three times the general population. For example, in India, the normal population has 10% of the population has mental health morbidity. If it gets affected like pandemic, then it will be it will increase by two to three times. That means 20 to 30 percent may have mental health morbidity. That's an example I'm giving you. But however, depending upon the situation, the mental health morbidity can be seen. It, you can divide this mental health morbidity into two phases: acute phases, which is between one to three months, long-term phase is more than three months. So if you look at the acute phase, the acute phase reactions are self-limiting and which need not require any kind of medications. But however, they are all self-limiting, but psychosocial intervention play a role in acute phase interaction. Whereas long-term long long, long -term phase uh, psychiatric morbidity requires mental health professional care. Sometimes they may do require medications also. But please do remember, Mental health morbidity in disaster survivors is two to three times the general population. Types of mental illness seen during disaster 
or during disaster survivors or in disaster survivors. Simplest, the first more is pre-existing psychiatric disorder relapse occurs. That means a person who had schizophrenia or who is on alcohol dependence syndrome immediately after the disaster, they may not get those medicines or because of the stress of the disaster, there will be a relapse of mental illness. That's first. Adjustment disorder and abnormal grief. Loss of family member can cause severe adjustment disorder, shock, denial, suicidal attempt are common. Next one is anxiety disorder like panic disorder, phobia or non-specific anxiety symptoms are common. Acute stress reaction, not able to sleep, insomnia, depression, death wishes, suicidal ideas or suicidal attempts. And the next very common uh, scenario we have seen in various relief camps is whenever they get money, the survivor starts taking alcohol and drugs. Post-traumatic stress disorder is another commonest one. Dissoci dissociative symptoms and somatoform disorder. And the very other commonest phenomena what we have seen in Indian population is non-specific somatic symptoms in the form of headache, dizziness, recollection of the events, nightmares, dreams, terrors or various other kinds of non-specific symptoms can be seen as a disaster mental illness. Next common is types of mental illness seen during disaster in children because the present the presentation of psychiatric symptoms in children differ from adults especially in disaster. In children you can see there the children have high resilience at the same time they are also vulnerable for any kind of disaster but if you provide appropriate care their brain bounce back very fast. The commonest symptoms what we can see is dizziness, vertigo, startle response, sleep wake cycle disturbance, excessive crying, clinging, not going away from the mother, holding her, irritability, food refusal, not mingling with other children, not playing and becoming and also having regressive behavior. These are the commonest symptoms seen in children along with school refusal, school dropout, academic decline, anxiety disorder like panic disorder, non-specific symptoms, phobias are also seen. Sometimes children after the exposing for disaster may develop oppositional defiant disorder. They become very extremely anxious. They start fighting with their parents. Contacts, contact symptoms like truancy, lying, stealing also has been noted. Post-traumatic stress disorder, depression and somatoform disorders are also have been noted in children. Who are at risk of developing mental health morbidity? That means who are the risk factor or who are the risk population who develop mental health morbidity. So there are three important high risk factors. One is disaster factors, human factors or social factor or also we can call it as economic or also call it we can call it as environmental factor. Moving to the disaster factors, severity of the disaster, threat of the disaster, duration of exposure to the disaster, loss of life, loss of family member. These factors play do a very important role in the development of mental health morbidity. Human factors like female gender, children, elderly population, physically disabled, chronic medical condition like diabetes, hypertension, cancer survivors, single parent, substance use, poor family support, poor social support, poor economic background and from people from lower socioeconomic status and the what we call it as minor minority community can develop commonly develops various mental health morbidity social factors like loss of economic loss of livelihood poverty displacement from the area of disaster ethnic minority and other social supports or family support can prove a high risk for mental health morbidity now moving to what is resilience see till date Various studies which have been noted is what are the psychopathology developed during disaster? That means what are the mental illness developed post-disaster? Looking at the number of people who are developing mental illness, but at the same time, more number of people did not develop mental illness. What is the reason? That is called as resilience. Instead of looking at the negatively at the pathology, 
look at the physiology who are able to bounce back from the disaster. That is called as resilience. Resilience is the time taken or the immediately bounce backing from the disaster. Any kind of disaster is called as resilience. We need to know what are the different forms of resilience factor. I have made a separate video for resilience. You can find that in my channel video that is basically YouTube channel. There are two important resilience factors, core resilience factors, supportive resilience factor. Core resilience factor is within the human being. It is genetic makeup, any developmental factors, childhood insult to the brain, substance abuse, presence of any physical or mental illness decreases the resilience. At the same time, supportive factor are cohesive community, sharing of community resources, minimal displacement from the disaster, Good social, good social supports, altruistic leader, good community support, and minimal materialistic leader, religious faith, and spirituality play an important role in fostering resilience. Next coming is, what is the role of mental health professional in disaster situation? What should a mental health professional like psychologist, social worker, or a psychiatrist do in disaster? So this, if you look at the four phases of disaster, heroic, honeymoon, disillusionment and restoration phase. So first at the foremost is all mental health professional had to play an important role in prevention and planning before the disaster strikes. Once the disaster strikes, curative role plays an important role and stress management. So there are three important role has to be played by the mental health professional, prevention and planning curation that is during the disaster and the important is stress management and these are the areas where we have to focus because disaster management is more of now prevention than cure so prevention is the best strategy in disaster management so what are the prevention before the disaster strikes public education activities like life skill education educating about the disaster mental health that is the first important disaster response training of the trainers basically as soon as the disaster strikes we need to prepare a army of people who can provide psychological first aid counseling skills stress management identifying common mental disorder referral life skills training so this is the second important preparing an army to deal with the disaster because as soon as the disaster strikes this the army of what we call it as volunteer should be able to go to the disaster zone, provide care. Disaster response network to develop a collaboration between the governmental and non-governmental agencies and community health workers so that the, the effective collaborative efforts of disaster management can be done. That is the third. Psychoeducation regarding mental health issues, trauma, substance use to the disaster survivors should be planned before in hand community level support, where if there is a disaster strikes, what are the community resources, where are the schools, where are the big halls and even the stadiums should be thought of and a disaster management plan should be done. Even there should be contingency management within the hospital of that is basically availability of more beds in emergency, availability of medicines for disaster management should be planned. Information education and communication is very essential especially in japan where earthquake is very common they do a what we call it as drill earthquake preparation drill there will be a siren especially in the schools as soon as that siren strikes the children are made to move or what we call it as exit without creating a chaos so that they go into a common area where they are safe from the earthquake where which causes physical structure uh, damage coming to the important is the honeymoon phase what should the mental health professional do during the honeymoon phase immediately after the disaster within three months the mental health professionals the psychiatrist should play an important role they should jump in to the disaster zone and start working as a being a part of multidisciplinary team because the number of psychiatrists are very less in india even in the disaster zone, the requirement of psychiatrist increases phenomenally. First and the foremost being 
providing mental health care to the survivors and also rapid assessment has to be done and also pre-existing mentally ill people and also substance withdrawal has to be dealt with immediately. See, many people do argue why should psychiatrists go in an immediate aftermath of the disaster. The point is very clear. If we had more psychiatrists in the disaster zone, then they themselves are the survivors first. Second, they may not be effective in providing care. They will be running around or providing care to themselves, to the family members. They may there effectively providing care would have come dramatically. Hence, in the disaster zone, especially in developing country like India, where the population is very huge, the psychiatrists need to move in into the disaster zone, do a rapid assessment, provide care to those people who have already psychiatric illness before the disaster and substance withdrawal should be managed. At the same time, the disaster psychiatry outreach team should be formed, rehabilitation planning to be done, dealing with healthcare work stress during the first two months to three months should be planned. At the same time, fostering the mass grieving has to be done. Especially we had seen in tsunami, the many bodies were not recovered. The family continued to believe that they are alive. But however, a symbolic mass grieving do play a role in fostering grief. Collaboration with administration is very essential. Mental health education and also educating the administrative personnel, local people, school teachers and local leaders do a play a role. Utilizing mass media to reach the survivors and to normalize their reactions and also helping them to understand that they have to structure the day. Utilizing and initiating collaborations with various agencies locally and also within the nation and international. And at the same time, we have to plan for research. Without research, we do not know what kind of intervention is very effective. At the same time, now we have to look into the curative time. That is, during the disillusionment phase, what is the role of psychiatrist and other mental health professional? This is the period where psychiatrist, psychologist and psychiatric social work need to work together. That is, providing care for the persons with mental illness and continuing and expanding the what we call it as empowering the community has to be done, training of resourceful communities, maybe ASHA workers, nurses, school teachers, Anganwadi teacher, complementary alternative medicine people, spiritual leaders, faith healers, community outreach camps, handholding of the community health workers, assessment, intervention and feedback mechanism has to be done. At the same time, this is the time when if there is no district mental health program has been implemented, immediately they have to be implemented and to be started. What are the different approaches for disaster mental health management? That means, as a psychiatrist, what approach should be taken? First and the foremost, there are two types of intervention. One is medication, that is giving medicine. Another one is psychosocial approach. Let's deal with each one of them. First, the medication. See, medication is very important for those people who had pre-existing mental illness and substance withdrawal. These are the two conditions where Immediately after the disaster, because of the stress and stopping of medication or stopping of drugs or alcohol, there will be sudden withdrawal and there will be relapse of symptoms. Hence, the medication has to be given to them. At the same time, the new arising of cases. The people may start taking alcohol, drugs, cannabis as a new cases or else there may be depression, suicidal attempt or acute psychosis. These are the cases we need to provide medications. So the role of medication is in pre-existing mental illness and substance uses and also the diagnosis of new cases where the medication is required. However, whether this medication can be used prophylactically. We I have done a review along with my colleagues on review of psychopharmacological, psychopharmacological intervention during the disaster. That is basically, can we give medication as a prophylaxis? Imagine, can we give medicine immediately after the disaster so that 20 to 30 percent of the population who develop psychiatric disorder can be prevented? But however, when we did the review, there is no evidence to provide prophylactic psychotropic medication 
to prevent mental illness. There is no evidence available at this point of time. However, there are some researches going on. Moving to the non-pharmacological intervention or what we call it as psychosocial intervention in disaster. First and the foremost is psychological first aid. This has been advocated by World Health Organization and also trauma focus CBT, critical incident stress briefing, EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, stress management, community based group intervention, art therapy, group discussion, dramas, storytelling, structuring the day, engaging in activities for the survivors, prayer, yoga, relaxation, sports, games, various non psychosocial intervention can be done. Basically, psychosocial intervention to be planned. Please do remember, innovation at the local level is very, very essential to provide care for longer duration. As I mentioned, disillusionment phase starts from 2 to 3 months to 2 to 3 years. It is a very long duration. The experts cannot stay in the disaster zone and aftermath of the disaster, invariably they have to go back to their native place. The disaster situation or disaster area need to look after themselves. Hence, community empowerment is the only answer. To address this, we have to demedicalize the experience that is basically instead of naming them as psychiatric disorder, demedicalize them, deprofessionalize the services by task shifting and task sharing. That means in district mental health program, we need to train the medical officers, alternative complementary doctors, faith healers in diagnosing and referring. And the medication we can be started by a physician at the district hospital or at the PHC hospital. That what we call it as deprofessionalizing at the same time, providing care at the doorstep is very, very essential. Hence, the innovation at the local level in the form of community empowerment is very essential. If you are able to empower the community in this disaster, in the next disaster, the community will be well prepared and they will deal with their disaster very effectively. Coming to the psychological first aid, this has been advocated very commonly by the World Health Organization. First and the foremost, the step is making contact. You have to contact the survivors and request them whether they require any kind of help and a brief rapid assessment of the need has to be done, protecting the people from further exposing themselves to the disaster, ensuring immediate safety, that is basically basic needs and comfort, gathering information, providing practical assistance, listening to people but not pressuring them to talk. Ask them how they can we can help them, in what way we will be able to help them, comforting the people, helping them to calm down, providing information, referring them where the information is available, helping them to contact the family members or various services and social supports. At the same time, making efforts to transfer them to the nearest hospital so that if they are injured. So these psychological first aid do bring down the disaster response or disaster reaction. This psychological first aid also has been found to be effective in terms of uh, decreasing the mental health morbidity in the long run. However, the results from various studies have been very uh, not so encouraging or not so uh, what we call it as discouraging also. But however, psychological first aid has to be has been been advocated across various countries. Take home message, please do remember, friends, the, the disaster survivors. These are normal people in abnormal situation, and please do remember. During in the phase, during there are three, diff, four different phases. Disillusionment phase, that is the third phase, is the place where curative role is there. But however, prevention role plays a very important role in disaster. And regarding the preventive aspect of disaster management, basically you have to start empowering the community, preparing the army of healthcare workers and also disaster relief workers, educating them psychological first aid, stress management, all do play a very important role in the disaster. But at the same time, please do remember, you are going to a disaster zone. You should not become a burden to the disaster survivors. You have to go and contribute. You have gone there as a volunteer. Please do behave as a volunteer, provide support. Don't become a burden on the people of survivors. Thank you very much. If you like this video, please do subscribe to my channel. 
Stay safe.